Meta crises are crises that affect people and societies not only in one place, that disrupt not only one system, but that run through many areas, taking hold in many subsystems, art and media, economy, science, politics, and of course, health. And in globalization, we can then experience the same effect we know from chaos physics. The butterfly strike in Tokyo can ignite a hurricane anywhere on Earth, or in our case, everywhere. Who doesn't know this remarkable poem by John Donne, No Man is an Island, which is actually a meditation from the book Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. Meta crises function emergently from the coincidence of several factors and new complexity is formed, which requires knowledge, abilities and skills on this very new level. Or as Albert Einstein put it, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Welcome to the keynote interview of part six of the Larnaca Conferences 2021. In 2018, these participatory conferences, planned as a social sculpture, began in Larnaca, Cyprus, a country and city unparalleled in the EU for strategic and econom economic location, climate, civic crisis experience. We are therefore particularly excited to listen to two Cypriots in the keynote interview, namely our very own Dr. Marios Kuriatsis, medical doctor and internationally renowned and honored longevity researcher who volunteers his heart and soul in Cyprus during Corona. <laughs> and with his work all over the world, especially caring for the elderly and Dr. Stavros Malas, Professor of Mammalian Developmental Neuroscience and Genetics at the University of Nicosia Medical School. Dr. Malas was appointed Minister of Health in Cyprus 2011, and he then ran for the presidency of the Republic of Cyprus in 2013 and again in the 2018 presidential elections. Uh, Thank you to both of you for being here with us today. Marias, you have the floor. Hello. I'm very happy to be with you all. And um, I'm going to ask a few questions to, for Dr. Malas so that we can uh, discuss the matter in some more depth. So the first question is, um, do you believe that it is necessary for a politician to have medical or health experience and in your case as a minister of health or is it necessary only to have managerial abilities and did your experience in health sciences help you during your period as a minister and how yeah interesting question man thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss but first of all if i were to ask the first part that is is it helpful for a politician to know about medicine put it this way uh, I think it's incredibly helpful. And in fact, uh, if politicians were to be given uh, a fast track course, how the human body works, they will get a very good idea how a society gets organized. You know, if you, that you are a body and you know that the human body works on the basis of equilibrium, that is um, health. So if you have a break in that disequilibrium, a big heart, for instance, then you can leave, but at some point you're going to die. If you have a small heart, you can leave, that means you're going to have, at some point you're going to have a problem. The same goes with our, all, all other organs. So the human body tells us that all the various different systems work in an equilibrium. And if you break that equilibrium, then you have a problem. The same with, with an economy. If you have a sector of an economy uh, driving the rest of the economy, then you have a very hypertrophic economy at some point that would collapse, and this is the case in Cyprus. Now, if you were to become a Minister of Health, and the question is, does it help? Well, it does. It does in two ways. So if you're thinking, first of all, of implementing a health system, a health system is made up of essentially two components. Uh, the first component is the organization of the provision of healthcare, and this is where medical knowledge is very important. 
And the second one is how the money is organized into the system. And that, of course, may not necessarily need uh, medical knowledge, but it's very helpful. And, and having spent uh, some time actually studying the implementation of the national health system in Cyprus, uh, it helped me when I was a minister, it helped me enormously to appreciate how you organize the system from the healthcare provision. I'm not saying we've done the best approach. I think we've not done a good job at all, frankly, um, because things have changed later. How, nevertheless, it's critical to have medical knowledge when you're actually designing a health, new health system, both from the perspective of service provision and also on the management uh, side. Yes. I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> that's... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I know. I had the same feelings as well, that uh, you cannot be a minister for something unless you know, have some knowledge about the something. Yes, indeed, and yes, many yes. people tell me the contrary, but uh, at least in the case of health, I think it is important to, Very important. to know the subject. Mm -hmm. yes, but, yeah, yes, let's move on to the next subject, which is about crisis. Um, do you believe that a crisis, like in our case in the pandemic or any epidemic, helps humanity become stronger and more resilient and healthier, or does it bring only negative results? Well, I think you need to you need to look at it from from two ways. First of all, you need to look at it from the point of view of how the economy works. Now, um, a pandemic has broken down a very it appears a very fragile equilibrium that existed in the world market. And it caused so much upheaval simply by pressing the button and slowing down the economy in, uh, in different ways in different countries. And of course, that uh, brings out another dimension. Uh, uh, what really has humanity done to encounter pandemics? Um, you and I are in the medical sector, and we know very well that we invest very little in research and development compared to what we invest, for instance, in developing arms. If we were to stop for five years um, the development of, of arms, or at least slow it down, and redirect 50% of that investment uh, into developing methodologies and drugs and, and therapies, we wouldn't have been in this situation today. The result of this pandemic uh, tells us, or teaches us better, that we need to invest in research and development to develop very many tools to be able to combat a pandemic. Uh, vaccines are one, uh, but drugs is another one, and drugs do take time. So. Um, I think that as, um, the modern world has failed really to subserve the needs of the modern world by not getting the priorities right. And I hope this pandemic teaches us the way forward. Now, the other, of course, important dimension, which I highlighted at the beginning, is the antagonism between major countries. Um, for those that are following market trends, you know now very well that some of the goods have gone up dramatically. The prices have gone up because of the war between different countries, like China is buying, you know, like Mad for and iron. And the, and the price of iron has gone dramatically up. Um, containers, transport containers became trapped in various countries and they got shifted in mostly in China. And so the cost of transport now has gone up. So a single, um, a single virus carrying uh, essentially nine genes, 10 genes, have, have caused so much upheaval in the modern world. Imagine what can happen in the future where more and more antagonism will actually um, get, into, uh, get into how countries are developing policy and, and how um, really, um, destabilizing it will be in the future. Yes. Um, and of course, 
is not just the virus that is causing the problems, but it's our response to that virus. Oh, yes. How we deal with it and um, the measures we take, good or bad, and the side effects of those measures. But I, I think it's important what you said earlier about the different countries responding differently because we are not just one homogeneous world. We are Absolutely. different countries with different uh, needs and, and problems. Yes, indeed. But if I can just um, add one point there, is that um, um, the pandemic also brought up differences in the perception in people minds about um, uh, drugs, about vaccines. We've had so many things. I mean, in, in the 21st century, we have still um, a, um, a, good, a good portion of our society believing that these vaccines will change our DNA, okay? And that is, that is really, um, to my mind, that is um, a symptom of insecurity not necessarily an ignorance, but also insecurity uh, that we live in. Um, despite the fact there is so much information out there and people can educate themselves properly, there's so much insecurity out there. And of course, that's been, you know, that's been um, uh, sort of taken up by many, many demagogues wanting to uh, portray themselves as, um, as um, saviors of the world. And they come out in social media and so on, and they influence people. So imagine um, what will happen in the future if we have a situation like this, or even a worse, much more complicated difference, different predispositions, what kind of. Yes, but the social media played a, a big role in this, good or bad. Um, we're not going to analyze it here. Sure. But I, I think technology and the way the world goes and develops. Um, has necessarily had to do with, um, with the, the presence of the social media because Absolutely. this is like a like a, um, a feeling system, not for the body but for the world. How how we feel? Do we feel insecure? Do we feel happy? Do we feel sad? All of these feelings are reflected through the social media. Yes. So this is playing a big role here. Okay, let's move to your uh, own subject, genetic research. And can you tell us in a few words how genetic research is uh, shaping modern society and which areas of genetics are the more promising for um, improving humanity as a whole? Sure, well, genetics, um, it's a relatively young discipline, uh, yeah, and in particular, what we call molecular genetics, that is studying the DNA at the molecular level. And so it has only um, 45 years of life. But sometimes I travel back to, to history, if you like, and remember my younger days um, uh, when I was a student, uh, a PhD student in the UK, and, and the techniques, and that was 30 years ago, the techniques we're using then to study the DNA were in many ways obsolete. I think. Now, let me give you an example just to tell you how fast genetic has moved. At the beginning of the, of, uh, the last decade, or rather 90s, the beginning of the 90s, the world therefore started to read the DNA sequence of two people, two French people, one lady, in one uh, man. And these efforts involved hundreds and hundreds of scientists from five countries, the United Kingdom, Great, um, USA, Japan, uh, Germany, and France. And they spent about $2 billion to read the DNA sequence of these two people. That used to be called the Human Genome Project, okay? Now, when that was published, um, it was hailed as a landmark. And indeed, it was a landmark in, in medical genetics because we knew the DNA sequence of those two people. But we spent two million, $2 billion. Now, to read the DNA of a single individual, those same two people, it costs you 3,000 euros. 
And of course, it will not, you're not going to spend uh, a decade, you're going to spend three days. Therefore, we can read the DNA of different people and we can establish why we look different. Now, you might say, what is the significance of that? Well, modern medicine depends uh, on the fact that we are different. We're not studying medicine to treat people when they're breaking their bones or when they have an accident. We study medicine to treat people when they suffer from a cardiovascular disease, which is a major killer, um, to study to treat people when they have cancer, when they have diabetes, many what we call multifactorial diseases. And they all have a genetic predisposition basis, which sometimes we cannot study and, and pinpoint because there are very many factors. But the, ver the fact that we have so many people across developing cardiovascular disease is because people are very different. So yes, human beings are made up of about 25,000 genes, which are very similar, but they're not identical in people. And those differences is actually the basis of medicine. And the challenge now is to develop what is called, um, and I think this will be a landmark in medical history, personalized medicine to be able to read the DNA of Marius and predict from that DNA sequence what combination of drugs Marius is better to be given when you have a situation of treating yourself. That's, that is a, the biggest challenge of modern medicine. And, and we need, of course, by studying the genes of people to revisit the way we evaluate drugs. And this is where another sector where medical genetics and, uh, and molecular genetics rather has helped. In the old days, when companies were testing drugs for cancer, they would develop a drug that was promising in the lab, and they would give it to people uh, that had cancer, usually terminal cancer, people that had no chance of life. And if that drug helped 10% of people and 90% died, they would call it a bad drug. They would throw it away. Now, scientists are revisiting and studying that 10% of people to see what common genes they had, and they do find them, and therefore they interpret the reason why the drug were going to 10% people, and therefore they go and modify the drug so they it can actually help more people. So these um, a process of personalized medicine, studying the DNA, and predicting the therapeutic value of drugs and developing drugs, I think that would revolutionize medicine. Well, there will be other ways, of course, that uh, medicine and, and genetics will revolutionize um, therapies. Since we're talking about pandemic and, and the use of vaccines, um, it's very um, um, much in the, in, the, in the public sector now the discussion about RNA vaccines or DNA vaccines. Well, in the older days, vaccines were made up of the substances of the virus or the bacteria. So the human body was given a piece of uh, attenuated, weakened, if you like, um, substance, and it developed antibodies. Now, the human body is not given a piece of that uh, virulent, if you like, substance. It's been given a piece of genetic material, which instructs the cells of the body to make that harmless uh, protein in this case, um, and then the, the immune system gets presented with it. Now, and that's been obviously used for, the, for encountering COVID-19. However, I see uh, the use of RNA vaccines um, in, in coming in the use of, of treating cancer. You know, cancer is actually a very easy disease. It's very easy disease in terms of actually studying it. It's a very um, difficult disease in, in actually detecting it because cancer cells can live in our body re and remain undetected by the immune system. And of course, will remain undetected until they cause a systemic problem. That is something we see in our body we feel a pain or whatever. So, however, 
if we use a vaccination, and in particular using this genetic engineering to make this vaccines, we can train the immune system to be on guard for killing cancer cells. Cancer cells have one very bad characteristic for, characteristic for them. They are producing substances on their surface that the body thinks are foreign cells. They learn to hide them, but if we train the immune system to attack them very early, then we'll kill and kill them. So I think the treatment of cancer will be revolutionized by modern vaccines, which of course are the result of modern medical genetic research. Now, there are lots of examples I can, I can think of, of course, you know, gene therapy and so on, but I think these are much more rare diseases. Uh, genetic diseases are very rare in comparison to what we call like quant diseases and so on. Yeah. I'm a bit worried about the concept of reductionism. So saying in theory that we will develop a genetic therapy in other words, a gene that has to be inserted on, on, a, on a human. Uh, this, in theory, can be done in the laboratory, but how can we use it uh, uh, in uh, many millions of people? And we've seen the example of the COVID vaccination for, for COVID, which the therapy exists, but pe many people are reluctant to take it, or they have side effects, or they worry about side effects, or they have benefits, but they don't know how to quantify those benefits. So I, I think I'm always worried about how research in the laboratory is translating into clinical medicine for people in the society. But if, if we can move on to your, to your own research on, uh, I think you've done some research on stem cells in the brain. Yeah. And, um, answer my, my concern about reductionism as well. Because I, yeah, I, sure, I can, of course. Uh, yeah, well, um, whether you develop a, a gene therapy protocol or whether you develop a drug, the concerns will be there the same. Usually people, um, are much more sensitive to talking about a genetic therapy because genetic really predisposes your thinking in something that will change your DNA or something that will actually make you, that impact on you in a very permanent manner, okay? So that I understand. So genetic research in terms of being applied as a therapeutic tool, it does not differ from um, research or developing a chemical drug, for instance. Okay. Um, nevertheless, however, um, the point of, on perception is very important. You mentioned about people's um, uh, opposition, or at least some people's opposition, to use an RNA vaccine. Well, I often give the, exa the, the example of an RNA vaccine against cancer. Now, if you get a, a vaccine against cancer, knowing that Cancer is a very life-threatening disease. That perception, in many ways, will change, and people will take that, if you like, risk of using that vaccine uh, if they um, have a, a predisposition for for cancer. So, so it's not a black and white situation. It's how we manage the situation, more or less, and how people get informed. So, uh, I can, of course, tell you about my own research, which, um, uh, which is <laughs> quite fascinating. By starting off to explain a little bit how our genes work so that people understand about stem cells. So as you know, we are all developing from a single cell after the fusion of the egg and sperm, a single cell um, develops and that cell has a, a library in it, our DNA. Uh, that library is what your mother, our mother and father gave us. Okay. Well, the cells divide, and of course, every cell takes a copy of that library with them. But of course, as the cells grow, as the, as the embryo grows, the cells become specialized. Some cells make brain, other cells make liver, and so on. The different organs are all deriving from that very single cell. And it's a very key question in, in biology to ask the question, okay, how on earth all these cells that derive from a single 
um, cell, and they all have exactly the same DNA, develop into specialized cells. And um, to answer that question, I just want to draw the analogy of a university. If you go to a university, you have thousands of student, uh, students studying different disciplines. They all have the same library. They go into the library. Medical students read certain books and they obviously attend lectures and they become medics. Uh, students uh, uh, genetics read similar books to medics, but they also read some unique books and they have some unique lectures and they specialize in, they become genetics uh, and so on. By the same analogy, cells in our body read only part of the genetic material that parents give us. So they specialize. They only make those parts, those micro parts that they need to become neuron cells, to become liver cells, to become lung cells, despite the fact that they carry an identical copy of the DNA. Now, in the brain, this question has been expanded. In other words, to ask the question, okay, we, in the brain initially, we have cells that make all the brain cells, and these are called stem cells. So how do these stem cells produce the sub-specialized cells of the brain. In the brain, we have neurons. And we have about 200 different types of neurons. So how do these cells become first neurons? And then how do the neurons subspecialize and become the different subtypes of neurons? The same goes with other supporting cells of our brain, the cells that um, support uh, the neurons and they make the myelin, the protective material surrounding the neurons. These are all cells deriving from the stem cells of the brain, but they're different cells. So our own research actually focuses on the question of how do stem cells in the brain receive signals and they translate those signals first to make neurons and then to make other cell types. This is a very key question. Uh, and why is it interesting to learn that? Because if we learn how in the in an embryo stem cells make neurons, and how neurons become specialized, then we can think of ways of taking stem cells, manipulating them in the dish, producing immature neurons, which are fresh, and implanting those neurons into the brain of people who, who suffer from a disease that is killing their neurons. A very classical example is um, um, Alzheimer's. Parkinson's disease, or even multi-neuron disease these days has been approached this way. Uh, so stem cell research, that is the research of taking, of studying first how stem cells make specialized cells, and taking that knowledge and transferring it into the clinic is a very, very promising field of study. So people like myself are providing with the basic science knowledge, uh, which uh, hopefully, it will be used in the future to develop uh, those uh, those therapies. Yes, uh, my own interest is aging and how the body ages. But particularly, I'm interested in the in the aging or non-aging of neurons. So um, you said that stem cells in the brain receive signals to become neurons or become differentiated. Um, so a good idea would be to look into those signals. What, where do those signals come from, and whether they, whether we can continue producing those signals to maintain the neurons in a healthy and non-aged condition for, for a long time. But I think that's that's a subject for for some other discussion because it's, well, if I can just say something, it's very important on that, uh, Marius. Um, you're right. Aging is very important because we don't like aging. We all want to stay younger, you know, and, and healthier and live longer. I hope we find, we find food to eat if we live longer. That's another, that's another issue. Uh, but, but indeed, genetic research has proven that cells that have specialized and they stop growing and they, they rest in our body um, and they function for years, they have a little problem in their DNA, their DNA gets trimmed, okay? So um, it gets trimmed, and if it gets trimmed, and it gets a little bit shorter at the end, 
then uh, this is uh, uh, the cause of aging. So scientists are working of stopping the trimming of the DNA in older cells to keep them younger. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting discussion, and I think we'll probably continue it at another time or in a personal meeting with uh, the two of us or three of us or whoever wants to come. But Lovely. thank you very much for your thank you very insight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the two of you. This was fascinating since uh, we hope the children already uh, also will uh, come to the conferences and listen. I think this will be quite introductional and thank you Dr. Malas for breaking this down. Yeah, it was a long time since I had uh, read a book on stuff like that and it was really helpful. The question that is arising now in context of the uh, broader aim of the conferences is um, how can humanity survive um, when the techniques and technologies and um, uh, wisdom we are um, achieving is creating people who live longer and do not learn at the same time to deal better with conflicts while the world population grows and grows and we are eating up our own planet? Yeah, so <laughs> I think this is a fantastic start to a broader conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I, if I can just say something on that. You know, please, please do. That. Um, I've had a very fascinating talk by a former EU commissioner about exactly this. In other words, there's a tendency um, uh, in modern economies to, for, for products, of course, to become more competitive, that is to have a lower economic a low cost of production, and the way forward is to use less people and more machines, okay? So that's the trend, and more clever machines in particular. Okay, so he predicted that by showing some very nice graphs that if we go down this path of essentially replacing human hands with machines, yes, we will make probably cheaper products, but we will make poorer people in the sense that these hands will not be used and they are produced in bigger amount because of the population is growing. So at some point, in order for, for humanity to survive, he actually proposed and showed that he modeled it. You need to go back to more hand-making process rather than actually using machines because you're also going to run out of material to make the machines. Um, so it was a very fascinating, a very fascinating talk. In other words, he said, you're making biological material, which is cheaper. Well, it's not cheaper, but you can make it by just feeding people. But the material, the raw material, is not produced at the same time as it gets used. So for, at some point, we're going to run out of raw material. And that will be it. <laughs> So it was a very fascinating talk, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Marius? I don't think it's only a matter of machines. When we talk about machines, we, we think of uh, machines that do things, but uh, it's also a matter about technology in general. For example, digital communication technology. Um, I've done some research showing that if we engage uh, digitally on, online mm -hmm. in a meaningful way, not just to talk about our, our cut or what we have to eat, if we engage in a meaningful way, this uh, produces um, like a, a neuronal stress response because the, the neurons want to deal with that information and it's like a stress response. And this produces several factors which may repair uh, age-related damage. So uh, digital communication technology and other technologies, artificial intelligence, may be useful in, in another, uh, another way. Good. Yes. Yeah, this is a wonderful start for a great conference. Thank you. We got a systemic point here at the end, and I think the participants will think about this, and we will have many fascinating questions. So thank you. To the both of you very much, I will now stop the recording.